Well, welcome everyone to our virtual BioBlitz, The Hidden Life of Orchids. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some of the characteristics that you need to identify what an orchid is, uh, a little bit about their life cycle, a little bit what their needs are, and then we'll be going more through groups of orchids, much more so than individual orchids, because in Michigan, we've got a lot of species of orchids. So I wanted to get to groupings of orchids um, and some of the more common orchids that you might find. My name is Ellen Holsey. I'm the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. Um, and as I said, today we're talking about orchids. So I have a few true and false questions to begin. I kind of want to know what your level of knowledge might be on orchids. Uh, and it's kind of fun just to do some fun facts this way. So true or false, you can put a T or an F in the chat. Orchids have six petals. What do you think? Do you think that's true? Or do you think that's false? And again, you could put true, false. Oh, I see a little bit of everything, which is great. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds. So I do have to say, I put a very deceiving picture as our very first picture here. So orchids actually don't have six petals, so that would be false. Orchids have three petals and three what they call sepals, which are basically things that protect the petals, but they're not technically petals. So it's a tricky question, I know. Um, and we'll talk more about what the petal is, what the sepal is and stuff like that in just a bit. So yeah, tricky to start with, but we'll see if you get the next one, all right? True or false, orchids use photosynthesis to make their own food. What do we think? Do orchids use photosynthesis to make their own food? a little bit of both, both true and false, which I love to see. That means we're not sure and that's okay. All right, give me a second more. So you're both right, to be honest. So I say true on this. So many orchids, uh, oh, actually it's false, excuse me. Uh, I'm gonna say it's true and false because many orchids do photosynthesize to make their own food. But there are some orchids such as this one here uh, that do not photosynthesize. And I'll tell you how they get their food. It's really interesting. This is actually called a spotted coral root orchid. And this one's actually on the property of the Institute. First time I encountered it, I was like, what is this? Um, and it is an orchid because you can see the flower here. All right, let's try another one. Orchids need fungi to survive. True or false? And this one's not a trick question like the last one. So orchids need fungi in order to survive. What do you think, true or false? I see both, which again, I know, not easy, true, false, but I like to know where you guys are. All right, so the answer, it is actually true. So fun, uh, fungi are really, really important to orchid survival. Maybe not when they're nice and big, but when they're initially growing. All right, and the last one, true or false? A single orchid can make only a few seeds at a time. What do you think, true or false? Got some people that are really on that chat, which is great. All right, so a lot of people think maybe that might be true. Uh, orchids are pretty rare, some of them, but the true answer is false. So a single orchid can make millions of seeds at a time. Even if it is a very small seed capsule, it can make up to like 3 million seeds. They're really small, but lots and lots of seeds. So that one's false. All right, so what is an orchid? That's enough for true false. I know, tried to trick you a little bit, but. So it's its own plant family, uh, Orchidaceae, and there's probably about 28 million known species worldwide of orchids. So quite a few species. Now, if you compare that to Asteraceae, which is another really species rich plant family, it has about the same amount. There's been debate about scientists, which one is greater. At this point, they're pretty equal. They have a lot of different species and that's more or less twice the amount of bird species that there are out there. Uh, 28,000, thank you, not million. I am back on my seeds. Thank you for correcting that. Uh, and about 4,000 more than mammal species. So there are many, many more species of orchids than there are a lot of other things out there. And 28,000, not 28 million. Thank you for correcting me. 
And they can grow in many different growth forms. Uh, so they can either grow terrestrial, so on the ground. They can grow epiphytic is another word is for it. Epiphytic basically is kind of like the idea of epiphyte. So they'll grow up in things, so like such as trees. They can also be lithophytic, which is basically growing on rocks or other media such as that. So those are the three main growth forms. Here in the United States, we only have terrestrial. If they are in the wild, we only have the terrestrial type. But you can notice um, the green is all the terrestrial ones. There are places that don't have a lot of orchids. Um, and there are other places that have all three. But orchids are found all throughout the world. The only place they are not found, Antarctica. So you can get orchids all the way up to Alaska, for example. And they can come in many different shapes and sizes. They can be very, very large. So the world's largest is up to 10 feet in height. Um, the world's smallest is uh, really, really small, 0 0.05 inches. Um, and so they can be of varying sizes. A lot of our orchids are gonna be a lot smaller than the largest and a lot bigger than the smallest. So the orchids in the US, we have about 200 species in the United States. In Michigan, depending upon what source you're reading, and I read lots of different sources, it says 57 on Michigan flora, if you look on that. Um, some other sources might say 56 because one is presumed is extinct. Uh, if you look on a website that I'll show you later called Go Orchids, which is a great resource through the Smithsonian, they do list a few more as well as iNaturalist and some of the ones that they list are hybrids. Um, and so I tend to go by Michigan flora. So I'm gonna say there are 57 different species of orchids. You may find more, which is great. Uh, but Michigan is the third most orchid rich state in the United States, definitely behind Florida. Florida has about half the amount of orchids that we have in the US. Uh, New York has just a few more than we do here in Michigan, but they include some of the showiest wildflowers as well as some of the most inconspicuous and rare ones. So some of the characteristics that we're looking for when we're looking for orchids, we're looking at flower shape, we're looking at leaves, and we're also looking at the habitat in which they're growing. Those are the three main things that you really want to look for when you're looking at orchids and trying to identify them. So when you're looking at the flower, lots of color. Orchids can come in many different colors. They can be green, they can be yellow, they can white, purple, pink, blue. You name the color, you're probably going to find an orchid in it because again, there's 28 thousand species so they can come in many different colors but one thing that they do need to have is what they call bilateral symmetry so if you were to take a line and go down the middle of the orchid the left side as well as the right side should look pretty similar just like if i cross, put my hand in front of my face my left side should look pretty similar to my right it's the same in orchids so they are pretty similar on both sides you just have to figure out where that center line is so the parts of a typical flower um, i'm just going to go over this for just a second so you know what a typical flower looks like versus an orchid because an orchid is a little bit different so you tend to get your petals uh, you have your stamen, which has your anther and filament. So these are the male reproductive parts. You have your carpal, which are the female reproductive parts. So that's your stigma, your style, your pollen tube. This is basically the ovaries where the seeds are made. Um, your stem, remember I talked about the sepals, which are as a protection for the flower buds. So when they're really close, they're helping to protect the petals and everything else, all those reproductive parts inside the flower. So when we look at an orchid, it's a little bit different. So we still have petals, but as I mentioned earlier, we have one, two, three petals. They still have those sepals, but they have actually one, two, three sepals, same amount as the petals. One of the petals, and this is a really important characteristic in orchids, is a modified petal. It's down here. The labium uh, is otherwise known as the lip. So that's the one that is really different looking. Um, this is a very important identifying characteristic in a lot of orchids. The shape of this in particular is really important. And we'll go over some different shapes in just a minute. The other thing that orchids have in their flowers that make them unique is they have a column that has 
both the male and the female reproductive parts together. Now, if we go back for just a second, remember the male parts were the filament and the anther and the female parts were all of this right here and they were separate. Well, on an orchid, they're all together in one column. So you have your anther here up on top. Here's your sigma, stigma, excuse me, which is your female reproductive parts. Inside your anther, you have your pollen, pollinia, uh, which will have that pollen on it. When you think of pollen and bees or pollinators, um, but all of that is in that one center column, which is right here. So that's a really important part when you're looking at orchids. All right, so I talked about the diversity of the lip, that bottom modified petal. So you can get pouch-like, which is what we're used to. Uh, we're used to that showy or those lady slippers. Um, moccasins is another word for it. So that would be more of the pouch-like. You could get it more fringed. Um, you could have them have look, look like modified anthers. There's more fringe there. Um, sometimes they're more lobed. This one's a little bit more lobed or you have lobes, kind of reminds me of an oak leaf right here. Um, sometimes they're more helmet shaped, uh, the showy orcus. Some of the orcus ones are more helmet shaped, but the, that shape right there, that is really important for identifying. And when you look at keys, a lot of times identification keys, that's one thing that they're gonna have you look at when you try to identify orchids. Another thing that's really important in orchids or another characteristic of, of orchids is how the flower actually develops. So some stems will twist when they develop. So you get that lip on the bottom. So the rose, oh, and I spelled that wrong. Pagonias, not Patagonia, the showy lady slipper and the fairy slipper all have that lip on the bottom. You can see it right there, one, two, three. But the grass pink orchid actually has that lip up top right here. And so they do twist, but where that lip is, is a good identifying characteristic when they actually open into the flower form. And that lip is really important as a landing platform for pollinators. So that lip, that's the part that's important to make more orchids. It's important to get pollinated so you can make more orchids. So if you look inside, remember we talked about the male reproductive parts, the pollina, um, right here. So these are basically uh, where you find the pollen. Uh, so they kind of, yeah, they're kind of heart shaped, I guess, in the way sometimes they're more separated, whether they have more separation or not can help you identify them. Sometimes it looks like you'd have just one. Um, this is actually one they come off and they'll actually attach that whole little packet will attach to the pollinator. Um, and so it's not like when you think of, um, I'm trying to think, my day lilies, for example, outside. I have all those different anthers that are out there that bees can rub up against or different pollinators can rub up against. They're rubbing up against basically right there. And some of them can be very sticky, so they'll stick right on to the, the pollinator. And they have really special relationships with some of their pollinators. Another reason why some orchids are kind of rare. Um, their pollinators are very diverse, a lot of times most, not all insects, they, some hummingbirds will pollinate them. Um, but a lot of times it's flies, it's bees, you have your moss, your butterflies, sometimes your hornets as well will be its pollinators. Uh, and they try to deceive or uh, have their pollinators come to them in different ways. So sometimes they'll have fake anthers. So those are those male reproductive parts. Remember, that's not the anther. The anther is actually in that column. Um, sometimes they may look like something else. So this kind of looks like a face to me, but sometimes it may look like a bee. <laughs> this is a bee orchid. Um, so they may have a look-alike way. So trying to attract their pollinators that way. Uh, they also may trap. So lady slippers, I don't know if you know, will actually trap their pollinators in a way, kind of like a pitcher plant. If you think of a pitcher plant, they'll enter through that little slipper part. So we've got the little hole part that the foot goes in. Well, the pollinator goes in this one. So the pollinator goes in and where the pollina is, they actually have to come out through that area. So it'll get stuck. That pollen will get stuck to the pollinator. They think they're getting something good in there. Unfortunately, there's no nectar for them in there. So the pollinators are actually getting kind of tricked uh, in this scheme. Uh, but sometimes there is nectar or other rewards. Uh, some 
Uh, orchids have really, really long nectar spurs. This is called a nectar spur because it has a lot of nectar in it. Uh, and some moths have specific mouth parts for that really long nectar spur to be able to get into it. Uh, not the ones here in Michigan, but there are some other ones uh, throughout the world that have those adaptations. All right, so we went a little bit through flowers. I know I went fast, but we'll go over it as we go through some identification. The other thing that you want to look at when you look at all of these different orchids, you want to look at leaves. Um, the leaves should be simple and parallel veined if they have leaves. So if you're looking at an orchid and it has no leaves, that is a good indication of a particular type of orchid. So one, for example, here in Michigan, a coral root, which is a particular grouping of orchids that we'll go over, has no leaves. So that might be a good indication it's a coral root. Uh, if it has basal leaves, so the leaves are at the bottom of the stem, uh, it could be, if it's pink, such as this one, a calypso orchid. Um, if it's got leaves on the stem, whether they're alternate, so not right next to each other, or they are opposite, which means that the leaves are right next to it, each other, can be an indication of what it actually is, which orchid it is. And the last one is a world pattern. So if the leaves are in a whirl around the stem, there are two orchids here in Michigan, both world pagonias, uh, that have that whirl pattern. So that's a really way, good way of describing them. Both of those are pretty rare. Uh, so you probably won't find as many with the world pattern, but just to be aware that they are out there. So orchids are what they call monocots. You have monocots and dicots, if you remember back in your plant days. Uh, so that's another thing when we talk about leaves that have parallel venation. Uh, so the veins basically go the length of the leaf is because they are monocots. And monocots tend to have uh, their petals in groups of three, for example. So again, one, two, three, and then three sepals, one, two, three. That's what I, mainly that I want you to get out of this part. They also have a few different growth forms. Um, the growth forms aren't as helpful for the ones in the wild. I will tell you, uh, one of the growth forms does have something called a pseudobulb. Sometimes people will call them corms as well. Corms are usually what they think of as an underground tuber, whereas a pseudobulb tends to be more above ground, but it basically is a storage organ. So some of our organs do have that. Um, but that tends to be on a particular growth form called sympodal. So sympodal is basically you have your orchid and then you have a runner coming out, so a rhizome, and you get another one coming up right next to it. And then you have that rhizome coming up, another one comes next to it. So it grows more horizontally. Whereas if you ever heard of an, or hear of an orchid that is monopodal, it basically means it'll grow straight up. Um, so you don't have that horizontal growth. Uh, and a lot of times when you're looking at how to grow orchids in the house, they'll talk about sympodal versus monopodal growth because that makes a big difference if you're keeping them in pots um, on how you have to take care of them. But basically the difference between sympodal and monopodal, sympodal, they grow horizontally, monopodal, the orchids grow up. Um, and for in the wild, these sympodal ones have that pseudobulb, that storage organ as well. So where do we find our orchids? Well, here in Michigan, we tend to find them in wetlands, in meadows and prairies, as well as forests. And wetlands, I am grouping bogs, fens, um, swamps, all of that into wetlands. So you may get an orca book, and I'm going to tell you one book that I highly recommend at the end of this, um, but it'll say in tamarack swamps, or it'll say in these type of bogs. So I'm grouping all of that into wetlands right now, um, but if there's a particular orchid that I talk about in just a bit, uh, I will, might call out what type of wetland. But definitely wetlands, meadows, prairies, and definitely some in forests as well. So they tend to have a wide range of where they can be. But in Michigan, we do have quite a few orchids that are under threat. Um, by under threat, I mean they are either endangered, threatened, or of special concern according to MNFI, so the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. So under the state laws, they are protected. Um, so that's about 15 species out of our 57 species. Uh, these are two of them. I did mention the one before, the small world 
Pagonia is actually extinct. It's labeled right now. They have a big X by it. Um, if it is found ever again, uh, they'll obviously take it off that, but it has not been found in a while. Um, some of these we can find around. Uh, so we have the Orcus, uh, some Twiblades, and we'll go over these. But um, if they are endangered or threatened in the following slides, you'll see a little T, a little E, or a little S C by the Orchid. Um, and I wanted to just point that out. And a lot of them are under threat uh, because they have some of those specialized relationships either with pollinators or with fungi. Um, so if you think of an orchid life cycle or of a plant life cycle, you usually think of a seed, usually a seedling, and then an adult plant. But in an orchid life cycle, we have a seed, we had a, have a protocorm, then you have a seedling, and then you have an adult plant. And the main thing here that I want you to get from this is the protocorm. We, it's basically the time that the seed combines with something. So the seeds are basically what they call dust seeds. Um, lots of seeds, remember? Many, many millions of seeds in one little seed pod. But I like to think of it as a seed without a lunch box or a lunch pail. Uh, a lot of times when you have a seed, it's got a little bit of energy reserve, so it can basically come out of its seed coat, it can start growing. These seeds, there's no room for any type of energy packet to go with them because they are so small and you can see they look like dust. So in order for these seeds to survive, they actually need to combine with a type of fungus. So this fungus is actually called mycorrhizal fungi, uh, one of my favorites if you know me at all. Um, and this fungus actually helps them get nutrients, it helps them get uh, carbohydrates or sugars to start off life. Um, and so they start with the seed form and into that initial stage where the seeds are starting to grow that protocorm, they need that fungi in order to survive because they need the sugars from the fungus, all right? So how's that works? Well, usually when you have that mycorrhizal fungus plant relationship, the fungus is getting sugars from the plant because the plant makes the sugars, fungi can't do that. And then the fungi give minerals back. But in this circumstance, basically the fungus is giving, getting sugars from another plant, then giving those sugars to the seeds of the orchid. Uh, and so they're just kind of passing it along in a way, it's a little parasitic. Um, so you see all these white parts here, that's all that fungus that's helping the seeds start to grow. Later in life, they may or may not utilize that fungus. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, a lot of times if they do, they may be either fully dependent upon that fungus so those would be called full mycel heterotrophic or heterotroph plants. Um, they fully rely on the fungus. They could be partial. So they might only if they really need to, they aren't doing so well, they're in the understory, they're not getting enough sunlight, might they rely on that fungus for sugars? Um, but in the end, they're still getting some sugars from an adult plant. So the relationship, well, you start off as a seed, you get a little bit of fungus, you become a protocorm, so they initially have to rely on the fungus, and then they may or may not, depending on the species, rely on it the rest of their life. So that relationship between a fungus and an orchid is very important. And if we destroy the habitat, destroy the fungus, and try to get the orchid to grow back, it's sometimes really hard in particular habitats. All right, so I know I talked a lot about orchid characteristics, but we really needed to go through what some of those are before we can go on to the different species. So in summary, characteristics, they have three petals. One is the modified one with that lip and they have three sepals. So the, basically the things that are protecting the petals. They're stamens and pistils. So those male and female parts are fused together in that center column. They have pollen and pollina, basically those little guys, uh, yellow packets. They have small seeds without a food supply, no lunch pail in those seeds. Uh, they're monocots, so their leaves are simple, and they also have the veins going straight down the leaf. And the flower will move, or the stem will move, so the flower is a particular orientation. All right, so now that we kind of went over our different parts, 
I have another quiz for you. Let's see if you can tell which of these plant pictures are orchids and which ones are not. So is this an orchid? Put a Y in the chat if you think it's an orchid, an N in the chat if you don't think it is an orchid. And some of you are so quick on that chat. I'm very impressed. Oh yeah, I can't trick you guys. Uh, so everyone is definitely saying, no, no, this is a lily. And you can tell because look at those anthers. Look at how many there are. Um, it's not in that central column. All right, what about this one? Is this an orchid? Hmm, looks like it's got lots of petal-like things. This is interesting here. What do you think? Some of you responded. I'll wait a second to see if anybody else responds. I know it's a kind of tricky picture. Um, uh, yes, exactly. No question mark, right? Um, it actually is an orchid. It's called a crane fly orchid. So this is that central column right here. It's a weird angle. Um, so you've got the three pet petals basically, and then it's hard to see the three sepals, but you do have them in this one. And it is a tricky picture. Um, didn't want to make it too easy on you guys. All right, what about this one? This is what you might come across in the wild. Um, so what do you think? Would this be an orchid? I can kind of look up in it a little bit. I see something right here. It's a little blurry, unfortunately, but if I was to go to the next picture, you can see it a little bit better right here. So this is actually one of the most common orchids that we have in Michigan. It's actually not originally native to Michigan, ironically. Uh, it's been naturalized here in Michigan. It's native to Europe or Asia. It's called Hellborn orchid. But if you, I was to go a little bit closer, and I know that was hard, um, you can kind of see the column there. And then there's that lip again, that modified petal. All right, one more. Is this an orchid? What do you think? Yes or no? I can't trick anyone. You guys are good. I love it. All right. So this is no, this is an iris. It kind of looks like it might have a central column, but definitely not. Um, so wonderful. I think we're ready to go on. All right, so we have in the orchid family, there are five subfamilies, but we don't have to worry about all five of them here in Michigan. Uh, in Michigan, we really only have, well, we have four of the five, but not many in the, the one. Um, so one is mainly epiphytes, um, but, so this is one of the more common ones. Uh, most of the species of orchids are actually in this family. And that's a hard word to say, so I'm not going to mispronounce it for you. Uh, but it's basically mostly tropical epiphytes. We do have some terrestrial ones that are in Michigan. They do have pseudobulbs. Uh, I talked about that previously on the growth forms. Um, another big fam or subfamily is the orchid uh, daceae. Uh, this is a terrestrial one, so very common here in Michigan. There's the vanilla odia. Uh, this is what vanilla is in. We do we have. One that I can remember right now here in Michigan that goes in that subfamily. These are your lady slippers. Um, and then this other one is mainly in Southeast Asia. And they kind of break them down into which one's oldest and how many stamens. So remember those male reproductive parts that they actually have. All right, so the first subfamily we're gonna talk about is the lady slippers. Um, and we only have one genus here in the US. You kind of see it in that green right there. And we have five different species within that genus, all right? So we have the pink lady slipper, the ram's head lady slipper, which is actually quite little. It doesn't do it justice in this picture. A white lady slipper, a yellow lady slipper, and a showy. And if you see that little asterisk here, those are the ones we actually have, have found on the property of the Institute. The white lady slipper is threatened and the ram's head lady slipper is of special concern. So when you're looking at lady slippers, and this is the one most of us know, you're looking for that slipper or that moccasin shape. So that lower lip or those that lower petal will have that shape. Um, do be careful, some of the leaves may cause a rash similar to poison ivy. So if you get too close to these, just be aware of that. But lady slippers tend to be found in wetlands. So our bogs, our fens, and our swamps. Um, and these are some of the ones that we we kind of mentioned at the beginning, they're more commonly seen. 
Um, and so this is the ones that we tend to think of when we think of orchids. The showy lady slipper are, are the ones I tend to think of because I see quite a few of those at the Institute. Uh, but I was talking to a student the other day at the Institute and she was saying, I found a pink lady slipper. And we were asking her, are you sure it was a pink? Uh, and she's like, yeah, it was pink. We're like, well, was it pink and white? She's like, oh yeah, if it's pink and white, it's a showy lady slipper. If it's just pink, it is a pink lady slipper. Uh, so that some of those look alike sometimes. Uh, they also the differences between those, the pink lady slipper tends to have a crease, a deep crease down the center right here, whereas the showy does not. Um, again, if you're thinking about leaves, the pink lady slipper will have that basal leaf pair. So the leaf at the bottom of the stem, whereas the showy will have uh, alternate. So the leaves will be up the stem. Um, so that's what you're kind of thinking of when you're thinking of your lady slippers. But showy tends to be the one we see quite a bit because if we go back to this slide, um, we do see sometimes the, the, the yellow is pretty easy to identify by the color. This one's pretty rare and small. But if you're thinking pink versus showy, think about what colors you actually see. But again, mainly found in the wetlands. These are our easier ones. We also have something called, it's a uh, fairy slipper is kind of its name, but it's actually found in a different subfamily. It's found in that family that's grouped with all the epiphytes, so the plants that are found more in the trees and up high. Um, this one actually is not found in any fens or bogs or any wetlands. Uh, it is actually threatened in Michigan, so it's a little bit more rare to see. Uh, and it is found in more old growth conifer forests, which is probably why it is threatened in Michigan. Uh, it does have a pseudobulb, so if you look down here, remember I talked about sympodial growth, so the growth of the, some of the orchids that go horizontal versus vertical. This is one of those that is sympodial, so it does go horizontal. So it does have that storage organ right there. Um, and you can kind of see almost a slipper-like um, shape to it. Uh, but it is different than the lady slippers. It's not really, it's, it's related in the sense that it's an orchid, but it's not related to our lady slippers. Um, so if you find one of these, think yourself lucky, which is pretty cool. But again, found in a totally different habitat. This is forest. Lady slippers are more found in wetlands. If you're looking in wetlands and looking for other pink things, so we've talked about the showy lady slipper. We talked about, oh, I'll get to my, my, the hellboard in just a minute. Uh, well, we talked about the, the showy lady slipper. We talked about the pink slipper. Um, these are other pink orchids that you're going to find in your bogs. These are the big, the big bog three, uh, if you think of it that way. Uh, you have your dragon's mouth, your grass pink, and your rose pagonia right here, which I misspelled previously. I apologize. Uh, the grass pink is one of the more common ones, which is this one. And this is the one where, remember that lip is upside down. Uh, and that's a good way of identifying that one. Uh, the other two, the lip is on the bottom. Uh, they're they definitely found in undisturbed bogs and fens. They tend to be sun lovers. Uh, so they love to be in the sun. Uh, they look similar to the Calypso, but Calypso again tends to have more of a slipper part. Um, but these are the three, the other three that you may find that are pink in wetlands. Um, but grass pink is probably the easiest to identify of them because again, that lip is at the top. Dragon's mouth, the reason why it's called dragon's mouth, it's got those fake anthers on it. Uh, so kind of think of a tongue uh, with uh, different hairs on it. It's hairy tongue, I guess is the way of thinking of it. And the rose one tends to be more frilly along the outside. Think of it having ruffles. Um, and so the rose is actually the one that is more closely related to the vanilla orchid, uh, interestingly. So those are the other ones that you're going to find in a bog. Another one that is also in that same subfamily as the epiphytes, so the ones that grow on the trees, but these are terrestrial, they grow on the ground, are, are coral roots. Uh, so there are four different species of coral roots that you may find spotted, fall, early, and striped coral root. They're not gonna have any leaves. So they're gonna look a little strange, okay? So I will warn you on that. They're actually called coral root because their roots kind of reminded people of coral, if you kind of see that shape of that right there. Um, when they do grow, they can grow greenish. So this is the early coral root. 
but they also might grow a little bit more reddish in their stems. These are mostly parasitic orchids. So basically they can't make their own sugars. They need to rely on that mycorrhizal fungi that relies on other plants in order to get their sugar. So it's a weird, a plant relying on a fungus to rely on a plant in order to grow and survive. Um, so that's why I find these completely fascinating. Um, you, if you see them later in the season, you'll see them with these little seed capsules coming off. It's kind of almost like drooping elongated balls in a way, um, but they're coming off. And again, no leaves on them. Uh, we do have the spotted coral root at the Institute. Uh, so if you do get a chance that's to see it, um, it's sometimes confused with beech drops, uh, which is another parasitic plant, not uh, so similar to these orchids that are a little parasitic, um, but it is different. But so these are, as I said, no leaves, um, they tend to be more reddish in color, but if you get really close, you almost need a hand lens in order to see these guys. You can see that orchid shape right here with that lip and the petals. And again, there's that lip, there's that lip, there's that lip. So those are our coral roots. And as I said, they are fully micro heterotrophic. So they fully rely on that fungus in order to grow and survive, most of them do. All right, somebody had asked about the Hellborn. Hellborn, excuse me. And I actually have my book here. And I don't know that other name, Lenten Rose, but let me look it up because I did bring my book with me. Uh, so this is a huge book and I don't enjoy it too much just because it is mainly the cultivated orchids, if you can kind of see, but they do have the, uh, the Hellborn in here. It doesn't say another common name there. So I will have to look that up, Jackie, and tell you later if it's also called the Lenten Rose. So I will look that up. But it is an introduced species, which I find interesting. Um, it was introduced from Europe and Asia originally, but it has been here in the United States for such a long time, it's naturalized. It's not invasive, that's different. That means that they spread quite a bit, cause harm. Um, this is just one that we find quite a bit. It rarely occurs in large colonies or dense stands, but you do find them in mixed forests. So by mixed, I mean both deciduous as well as conifers uh, and very disturbed areas. So ditches uh, in parks, in some gardens even. Found all over your yard and gardens, exactly, John. So you can find it in a lot of different places. And if you look really close, so these guys can get up to about three feet tall. That's pretty tall. Um, but you can kind of see it's got lots of flowers right at the top. So that would be all of that would be that inflorescence. It's got broad leaves, but remember the, the veins on the leaves run the direction of the leaf. So uh, the veins are, this is the leaf that way, parallel veins, there we go. Um, and then you see the lip on the flowers, um, but they can vary in color. So they can be a green to a deep purple color. So they may be a Lenten rose. I'll have to look up that common name. There are a lot of common names for some of our orchids. And so I don't know all of them, unfortunately. But this one is common uh, throughout the state. And it doesn't have any other, because it is not native to here in Michigan, I couldn't group it like the coral roots. We have four different species. This is its only one within its genus. So, all right, so the last group that we're gonna go over that has probably the most species that you could ever imagine um, is that last subfamily, the orchid adaceae, which is that terrestrial cosmopolitan, basically means it's everywhere. Um, and these are your fringed orchids or your, what you call your bog or fringed orchids. These are your lady tresses, if you've ever heard of those, your twait. Why, blade, excuse me, your rattlesnake plantain orchids, as well as your showy orchis or your orchis. Um, they tend to have only one anther, um, but they're the second largest subfamily of orchids. So there's quite a few of these in particular here in Michigan. And the largest group that we have, the largest genus, is the ones that include the fringed or the bog orchids. So these are some of your most ornate orchids. Think of it as the frilly ones. Um, this is the ones that have the fringes. They, we have a couple that are endangered, a special concern, a couple at the Institute. Remember the stars are at the Institute, but they grow in a wide variety of habitats. So forests, meadows, wetlands. But the thing you need to think about on these is the fringe. Uh, they tend to be 
tall flower filled spikes. So if you go back to the last picture, you saw all the different colors that you could get, right? But they tend to be in a spike. So they're going to be tall. They have lots of little flowers at the top of the stem. Uh, so that's what we mean by flower filled spikes. Uh, and also the most identifying characteristic, which is hard to see if you don't have a little lens, a uh, flat anther. And by anther, remember that male pre reproductive part. So this is the anther, they're flat. They're not circular, they're flattened. Um, and so if they, your orchid tends to be more fringed, it's a high likelihood that they're gonna be in this group. And so that can help whittle down, but even within this group, you've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, four, five, 15 different species. Um, I'm trying to get you down to that 15. This is a really large group, but if you're finding fringe, and the purple fringe orchid is pretty common in Michigan. Um, I know we have that on the property. Um, it's going to be in this group, all right? Okay. All right, so the next group that are kind of fun are the lady tresses. So these are all small white flowers. So if you have a colored one, not gonna be in this group. Uh, they're all small, they're all white. They have that spike again. But the cool thing about these, they're called lady tresses because, oh, thank you. They are hellborn. Oh, Lenten rose are hellborous, not an orchid. Thank you, John, for looking that up for me. Um, but these lady tresses, think of a lady's hair. So lady tress. Um, and it's a spiral. So it kind of looks like it's braided, um, but you're looking for that spiral when you're looking at these. If you look really close, you see those lips uh, right down here, that bottom modified, um, modified petal. But what you're looking for to know that it's a lady tress is that they're gonna be in a spiral, they're gonna be white, they're gonna be small. But once you get to that lady tresses, it's kind of hard to go farther. Um, you really need a hand lens in order to do so. Uh, there are some other identifying characteristics. And as I said, I will point you to a book that will help you with that. There are nine species of this, um, but you wanna look for that spiral. And this is the overhead look right here. Uh, this is what the spiral looks like if you're looking straight on. So think of that spiral, all right? A lady's tress, a lady's braid. I'm wearing my braid today for that reason. All right. All right, one of the last groups that we'll go over is rattlesnake plantains. So these guys are mainly found in what they call coniferous or mixed forests. Um, so coniferous basically meaning your pines, your, your tamaracks, uh, your uh, conifers, mixed, basically a mixture of that with deciduous trees. They have small white flowers again. Uh-oh, another small white flower. But these small white flowers uh, aren't gonna have that spiral for the lady tresses. What these have, and there's only four of these, they have basal leaves, that's an identifying characteristic, but the very most important part of that basal leaf is that they have basically, the leaves kind of remind you of a common plantain leaf. Or if you think of it this way, think of it like rattlesnake markings uh, hence the name rattlesnake plantain. So it almost looks like they have scales um, or resemble the back uh, or the tail, excuse me, of a rattlesnake. So uh, the rattler. Uh, so think of the leaves. You really want to look for the leaves on these and you can kind of see the leaves here where it looks like it almost has scales to them. Some are a little different than others. Uh, so this one has more of a central vein there that you're seeing and not much of the, the scale-like um, but that's what you're looking for. You're looking at those base leaves and you're looking for that rattlesnake pattern or that scaly pattern on those leaves. But they're all white, small and white, just like the lady tresses, but no spirals. You need that spiral for the lady tresses. All right. All right, we have the orchis. Not to be confused with orchid. There are only two in this group. Um, and here's where taxonomy gets weird. Um, they sometimes have different taxonomic names because they've been changed over time. Uh, sometimes you may find them within the same genus, the Galeria, Galerius uh, genus. Sometimes you may find them in different ones. They're both known as orchis, so round leaf orchis versus showy orchis. Um, though the round leaf is found more in swamps 
whereas the showy is found in deciduous woodlands. These are the ones that have what they like to say more of a helmet shape. And so you can kind of see where the petal kind of comes up around that column. Do you see where it kind of comes up around the column? The lip comes out, but the petal, the other two petals come up and form almost a helmet. Um, so that's what makes these guys unique. So if you see that helmet where the petals are coming up in Michigan, you probably know that you have a showy orchis and you are very lucky because the, these guys are both threatened or endangered depending on the species. So probably won't find these, but if you do, you're lucky. Good job. All right, last grouping. I know I've kind of thrown a lot at you, but I tried to group them into their genus or their grouping uh, to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking for when you're looking for orchids. Uh, so this is the last one. It does have a couple of different, two different genus, uh, net, net, ne, Neotia, excuse me, and Leparis. They're called the Twiblades. All right, so both of these are called Twiblades. The reason why they're called Twiblades is because the lips of the flowers are forked or two lobed. You can see it really well right here or heart shaped. There's the lobing right here. There's the lobing right here. You can kind of see it, but in that bottom lip, it has, it's forked, all right? The petals are sepals, curve back. So you can see it right here, it's curving back. They're really small. They tend to be more greenish color. Some of them will have more of a reddish, but definitely a little bit more greenish here. And they're found more in wet soils and wetlands. Um, so not white, like our ladies' tresses, not white like our rattlesnake plantains, more of a greenish color. And also, as you can see, really, really small. They do have some opposite leaves to them as well. So that's our last grouping of orchids. So now let's go into identification. So we kind of went over some of the groups. How do I go out into the field and actually try to identify these? Well, first thing to think about when you're going out into the field, Orchids are really rare because of orchid poaching. Really rare because we want to go out there and take pictures, which is great, um, but we want to leave them in nature. And we also want to be careful when we do go out and take pictures and try to identify them because sometimes orchids can get destroyed due to trampling. Um, I am going to skip over one thing for just a second. I'm going to skip all of my questions here. Um, the who am I? So who am I? Let's see if we'll go through quick. I see a spiral here. So this should be our spiral, our lady tresses, all right? I want to get to the identification. So who am I? Well, I can kind of see me. Let's get a little bit closer. I have a fringe. And so this would be our fringed or our bog orchids. So genus Plantanthera. All right, quick again. Or pinkish again. Hmm. If I get closer, oh, looks like I'm flipped upside down. This should be our grass pink. So one of the big bug three. These guys are going to be found in the wetlands. All right. So now let's get to our identification. So these are some of the things that I used to look at orchids. These are some of the resources that are some really great resources. Lots of pictures. Um, some you can bring to the field with you, some you have to go back home and try to figure out what you got. Um, so one that you can't bring unless you've got cell service on your phone, Go Orchids. It's through the Smithsonian as well as through the North American Orchid Conservation Center. But they've got a really great website that basically helps you identify by habitat, by location, and by location I mean state by leaf arrangement, by number of leaves on the stem, um, the form of the lip, all those things. So lots of great information. They define what the terminology is. So if you're like, what was that again? I don't remember what that word meant. Uh, they help define it, though there is no smartphone app um, and some of the common names can vary greatly as we were talking about early about common names, right? Um, but if you look, for example, this is when we're talking about the lip, you can say, I don't know, it's not pouch like you say it's pouch and it'll help you narrow it down. So it's a, like a taxonomic key, but it's all online. Um, again, this is, you can go by color of the flower, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And so that's the Go Orchid. Um, it's a great resource, but you do have to have cellular data and just search the internet for this one. There is no smartphone app. 
Um, but as I said, it's a great resource, especially if you're not in the state of Michigan, you go somewhere else and you see something, you want to figure out what it was, take a picture, bring it, bring that picture back and try to picture it, figure it out from that. Uh, another great one that is a smartphone app is Michigan Wildflowers. I've talked about this one before when I've talked about spring wildflowers. This is one you can get on your phone. It is free. I love my free apps. Um, it helps you narrow down what plant you have by what you've got. So it'll ask, is it a wildflower, a shrub, a conifer? Well, obviously our orchids are not going to be conifers. What flower color is it? Uh, it'll ask you how many petals does it have? Flower size, leaf arrangement, all these questions. You don't have to fill everything in because you start off with many plants. If I just say it's a wildflower and it's pink, um, I say it's a regular. Um, I can get down to the wetlands. It'll go down to 20 plants and then it might get me to my orchid or my lady slipper. Um, so that's what I had to do to get to lady slipper. But if you have any variation in color, this is kind of a hard one to navigate. You can only use one color in it. And if you don't use the color they expect you to use, uh, so if this one looks a little bit more purplish to you uh, than pinkish, then it won't get you to the right place sometimes. Um, so that's the limitation, but it is great because it's got lots of great information. It's got maps, it's got written information, it's got pictures. So I do like it for that sense. And it is free, you can't hurt that, right? Um, the last one that is, as you, many of you may know, I'm a huge fan is, of, is iNaturalist. Again, a free app. Uh, this is one that you take a picture. You, you don't put in your choices of pink or whatever. You take a picture with it and it can help you identify things. Uh, and the great part about this one is it helps scientists as well. Um, so you just need to make an account. Go to iNaturalist.org. You make an account if you don't have one already. Uh, you can either just use it on your computer or there is an app for it, which is great. You go out in the field. If you can take a picture, you can use this app. Uh, so basically this is from my phone. I take a picture and then I say, use that picture. Um, now, when you're taking pictures, you need to take a good picture. Make sure that it is focused on what you want to take a picture. It's not blurry. It's not too small, anything like that. Um, but basically you go to this, what do you see button? And they're gonna help you narrow it down. They'll say it, they're pretty sure in what genus it is, hopefully, if you have a good enough picture. They think it's a slipper orchid. Uh, and then they'll give your top suggestions. And if you scroll down on that, um, this one actually only had four suggestions because there's not a lot of lady slippers out there. Um, so they gave you the pink lady slipper, the white, the yellow, which is not yellow colored, as well as the showy lady slipper. Um, and then they'll give you lots of great information, um, pictures, and there's a lot of pictures here, lots of written information. The one thing you do want to make sure if you do use this app, make sure your location services is, are on uh, because that way they can use your location to see what else has been found in the area to help you identify what you have. If they're not turned on, it's not a problem, but it's harder to identify. Uh, you also, if you don't have a cell service, wherever you are, if you're looking for orchids, you can also upload it as soon as you get to a place that has cell service, or you could use it, just upload it on the computer. You don't have to do it from your phone. Um, the other cool thing about this one is you can have somebody check your work. Uh, if you have a book, nobody else is checking your work, right? This one is great because you can say, I think it's this. Um, and then somebody else, a scientist, another person will say, ooh, I think it's this. Or maybe they'll say, hmm, I think it's something else. So once you get to research grade, somebody else has checked your work, it's good. You had that species. Um, if it's still a needs ID, somebody else still wants to check your work. Um, I do have a project on iNaturalist right now for this class, for the Hidden Life of Orchids. I feel like the best way to learn things is to get outside and go find some orchids. Um, so if you are in the state of Michigan, anywhere using iNaturalist, all of your observations will be put into this project in the next week and we can see what orchids have been found, uh, which is the fun part. Uh, if you also just wanna figure out what other people have found uh, in Michigan, you could go to this, you go to projects under iNaturalist and search for uh, if you type in hidden life of orchids, you'll find it right away. Um, you can become a member of the project to join and then really see what's going on. Uh, but I just looked under iNaturalist today, this afternoon, 
and just said orchids, Michigan, to see what had been found in Michigan. According to iNaturalist, there's been over 4,000 species found, or 4,000 individuals found, 61 species, which wait a minute, there should be not 61, there should be less. Some of those are hybrids. Uh, I did look them up. Some of them are hybrids. So I guess some of the orchids can hybridize. Um, and so even though there are 57, it says 61. And 387 people have found orchids. And the cool thing is when I did, did this, um, the last one that was found was in Barry County. Today, they found a rose pagonia, which is one of those three big bog species. Um, and so it's another fun way of seeing what is around. Last but not least, if you do find rare orchids, please report them to Michigan Natural Features Inventory. You can also report them on um, iNaturalists and they'll ask probably for some good pictures of everything. But that lets us know in the state of Michigan where they are and what we need to protect. Um, and so you can just go to their website. Uh, if you go to uh, report an observation, you, there's a whole nice little form here that you can report it, upload pictures and stuff, so it can help us protect our orchids. If you do choose to do iNaturalist, um, as I said, that's up for a whole week, that project. I'm just I'm curious what we see in one week. Um, but if you have any problems with iNaturalist, feel free to email me, all right? Um, I've used iNaturalist for quite a few years now. Uh, as I said, I'm a huge fan, uh, but I want other people to use it so we can learn more about it. The book I would recommend for Michigan is The Orchids of the North Woods Field Guide. This is a great book, great pictures, tells you where to find things, tells you lookalikes, all of that. And it's nice pocket sized, which I, pocket sized is big pockets, but I appreciate that. Um, so that is the book. You can get it for like $18. Um, it's a great, great book. Uh, and it covers Michigan as well as two other states, I believe Wisconsin and Minnesota as well. As I mentioned, some great websites and smartphone apps, Michigan Flora, North American Orchid Association, so that's that Go Orchids, iNaturalist, and the Michigan Wildflower app. And just for fun, uh, I did find on the Smithsonian website, you can make your own orchid origami. So you can, if you can see my picture, you can print these out and make a showy or a uh, lady, pink lady slipper, or lady slipper orchid uh, with origami. So if you feel like being creative, you could do that. This PowerPoint I will send to you. Uh, it's it's rebrand.ly forward slash MI orchids if you want it now, but it will be sent to your email in a follow up email as well as the video recording of this presentation. Um, so at this time, I realize I'm at time. I apologize for that, but I would welcome any other questions. Uh, John did my homework for me by saying that Lenten rose are held boris, but not an orchid. Um, and so thank you, John, for looking that up. I do appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.